All right, what's happening, y'all, man? It's your boy Rico from Street Scores, and of course, we got to talk about everything that went down in this game. Y'all know me, man. When we do the game reviews, we go player by player, position group by position group. So we're going to talk about everybody that had a positive and or negative impact on this game. But overall, man, we got to start with the fact that thank goodness for Terry McLaurin, man. That is a different type of guy. And we're going to talk about Taylor Heineke in detail and how well and how not well he played at certain times in this game but one thing about terry mclaurin is he is going to throw that ball up and i mean when in doubt we're paying him all this money he's our best offensive player why not at least give him a chance to make a play and even though that 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 catch right there at the end wasn't the best throw at the very least he gives his guy a chance to make a play so that's one thing i'll always really appreciate about um taylor heineke but man this was the terry mclaurin game that was so beautiful that was a disney movie ending bro the fact that terry mclaurin in front of his hometown born and raised you saw even at the end of the uh, the, the big contested catch he was like this is my city this is my all of that type of stuff man i felt that that was like tears in the eyes type of thing and like i said that before the game even happened um a few days ago in one of my videos i was like man I, of course i want to win but the most important thing is that terry mccorn has a special moment in front of his didn't he say he's brought like 70 friends and family members to the game he went all out and the fact that, you know, Taylor Heineke, Scott Turner, they let him have his moment, I, I thought that was so beautiful. I, I'm way more happy about Terry McCorn having his moment than even the win that we got. And granted, it was an ugly win. And of course, if we weren't going against a struggling and inexperienced Colts team led by um, Sam Ellinger and with some drops from the receivers, we, we more than likely lose that game. But at the same time, a win is a win. And I, I mean, granted, that was an ugly win. And the last three wins, we are on three game win streak. I think that's very notable. But um, but we have won against some struggling teams. But I feel like at the same time, maybe we can get some stuff to click and we can fix some issues now that we're gaining confidence. And maybe we can beat better teams later on down the line. The way we played against the Colts today, we can't beat the Eagles, Cowboys, and probably not even the Giants with the way that we played today. But I, that does not take away my confidence in the fact that we can match up well against those guys because right now we're playing with heart. Like the way Bobby McCain was furious after they called that one play a touchdown, but really um, the guy was down at the one yard line. That shows this is a team that cares. This team cares. This team actually believes in themselves. They want to win. If we gave up on the season, Bobby McCain is not out there throwing a complete temper tantrum, having a conniption about them calling that a touchdown. Then they ended up reversing. It ended up being a one, uh, being on a one yard line, and then Cameron Curl and Jamin Davis make those amazing plays. It, instead of it being seven points, it's three points, and domino effect. We end up winning the game. If that was a touchdown, we lose the game. So um, it was just a lot of elements to that. One thing I also want to point out. Again, ugly win, but like I said, even when we go against better teams, the confidence that we're gaining from winning these ugly games, first of all, when you learn how to win ugly and close, that means you're you're not sweating, you're not shaking in your boots, you're not nervous when you're in these situations. We're built for this. We're used to these, got to go down and score a game winning touchdown on offense. Our defense needs to get a stop to end the game type of thing. Our defense and our offense is prepared for this. Uh, we know how to coach these games. Even though I felt like our coaching wasn't great overall, especially offensive coordinator-wise, Scott Turner-wise, and we're going to get to that. But I just feel like now that we've dealt with these really close, ugly situation game things that Ron Rivera loves for some reason, um, it's actually building a certain type of mentality. And when we get in these moments, we're not afraid, even if it is one of the better teams in the NFL, like I said, the Eagles or the Bills or the Chiefs or whoever, you know what I'm saying? You know, just playoff hopes wise and other NFC teams that are really good that we may end up playing in the playoffs. Um, I feel like even though it is an ugly win, like I said, the main theme is that we are built to win these. And I also, like I already said, I feel like as we gain more confidence from going on a three game win streak, we, we can go up into the Vikings, even though they're a really good team, the Vikings next week, like, Hey man, we're on a three game win streak. We're not afraid of anybody type of thing. And that may be enough to make the difference for us to potentially even beat them. Um, so again, I mean, you do got it. You have to be objective. You got to be analytical. You got to be logical you got to be honest if we played this way against the the way we played against the Colts today if we do that against the Vikings next week we're not winning point blank period they're a better team the Colts are not 
Um, but also one last thing before we, you know, this is a long intro. I just had to get my feelings out there because the Terry McLaurin moment, like I said, that's my favorite part of the whole game. And we're going to talk about it again when we get to the receiver section of this video. Um, but also I want to point out that we are dead last in the NFC East with a four and four record. The, the the next nearest team I think has uh, three losses. I think the Giants maybe who somebody hold on let me pull that up actually matter of fact right now before I even sit here and lie to y'all before I even sit here and lie to y'all folks man I know for a fact we're dead like yeah we're four and four the Cowboys are six and two it looks like the Giants are probably gonna end up being six and two either way we're two wins and losses behind the next team we're dead last in our division the falcons are four and four and they're first place in their division that just goes to show that the nfc east is literally the best division in football this season it is crazy i don't know what happened but we have no room to complain we made the playoffs and won the nfc east seven and nine a couple of years ago um technically taylor heineke um started against the bucks so we didn't technically make it with taylor heineke but you know what i'm saying still the taylor heineke debut year um but we we were seven and nine in a terrible division we didn't deserve to make the playoffs this year and so we can't complain when we're four and four and we're not in the playoff hunt right now technically even though we i mean we can we still got to play the eagles one more time we still got to play the cowboys uh, uh, um, again we still got to play the giants twice who knows what happens so it's definitely not over but it's just crazy that we're four and four and we're dead last in our division and the falcons are four and four and they're number one in their division and they tried their hardest to sell that game the way that hell mary went with dj Moore. then the the the, the um the panthers went ahead and just just sold that right back several times dj Moore um celebration kicker missing the pat then kicker missing the field goal in overtime that was just terrible that that, that was just a sell-off really honestly and so it's just sad that we are four and four and i feel like we are better than the falcons we play the falcons later on this season i think we'll beat them i think we played them in like four or five weeks but at the same time four and four in our division no playoffs four and four in their division you're the leader of your division like not even necessarily tied because they have the tiebreaker so that's just ridiculous but again we have no room to complain because we just made the playoff seven and nine which is basically what somebody from the nfc um south is probably going to do this year no room to complain we just got to be better again we play our division rivals more um we play the eagles once cowboys once and the giants still twice have we have all of the chances in the world to still make the playoffs not sure if we can catch up to the eagles who haven't lost a game yet who knows if they just completely go undefeated or even if we beat them where they're on say we best case scenario we beat them where they're only two losses they would still win the division um probably but at least we'll make the wild card and hey third time's the charm type of thing so the season is not over that's one of the main messages i want to give but again i want to also get it to through to y'all that we have no right to complain about being four and four and last place in this division um i mean we got ourselves here with a lot of those ugly losses like that titans loss we should have won that we should definitely be five and three right behind the giants and the cowboys by one win we should literally be right there but um but yeah man eight minute intro i'm sorry um <laughs> before we get into everything detail wise again y'all know me man i go all the way through position group by position group so we're about to dive into all of that but before we do make sure you subscribe to the channel at the bell next to the subscription button so you get notification immediately and every time i release an informative and opinionated video just like this one i mean as much as i talked about in the intro some people probably just gonna dip out right now at the intro i wouldn't even be mad at y'all but you know just emotions fresh off of when i had to let that one out because that was a crazy one that was one of the most fun but heart pulling heart wrenching wins we've gotten in a long time and if we would have just had that titans win you could really just call us close game kings anything that it comes down to the last play the last possession with that titans game i think we would just be undefeated in situations like that so it would have been nice if we won that but yeah man y'all already know um subscribe to the channel let's go ahead and dive into this again position group by position group analysis starting with the quarterbacks working all the way through the offense then we go to the defense let's get it all right so starting with the quarterbacks y'all already know man i'm still team how and i mean after this game i feel like i'm even more right slightly but at the end of the day like i said one thing about taylor heineke he's going to throw it up to the best players 
I mean, one thing I've always complained about just Scott Turner's offense, period, and even the quarterbacks playing in it outside of Taylor Heineke is that we use Terry McLaurin as a distraction rather than throwing him the ball and letting him make plays like that. I mean, that throw was not a great throw at all. And accuracy and just decision making wise, it wasn't necessarily a great throw. But at the end of the day, I don't care. You throw it up to Terry McLaurin and you let him make it. You let him decide if it's a good throw or not. You know what I'm saying? Let him wrestle it away. He was playing with a different level of passion than Stephon Gilmore was. I said, I predicted this before the game even happened. Remember when Stephon Gilmore won Defensive Player of the Year? And he was like the best corner in the NFL easily that year. Terry McLaurin was giving him the business at some point that year. But whoever was quarterbacking for us, Colt McCoy, um, Dwayne Haskins, Alex Smith, whoever it was, um, was basically just selling him. He was open, not getting the ball, or the ball would be thrown late or whatever. So I wasn't worried about Terry McLaurin versus Stephon Gilmore because that was when Stephon Gilmore had his best season of his career. He's not even that good anymore. He's still good. He's still a really good number one corner to have, but he's not the defensive player of the year, Stephon Gilmore, like he used to be for the Patriots. So I wasn't worried about that matchup at all. But still, um, I didn't see him going up and making literally a, that was literally a Disney movie type of play. Like literally, it felt like it was scripted. Terry McLaurin, hometown, first time playing for the Colts. Um, playing in Indianapolis since he's been in the NFL, playing against the Colts or whatever. Um, and just that magical moment for it to be him to basically go up there and win the game in an improbable situation. I mean, that literally felt like slow motion Disney movie moment, like literally like it was written to do that. Like literally fate. That was, I mean, it literally doesn't get any better and more magical than that, man. That was amazing. But again, going back to Taylor Heineke, not necessarily the best throw, but at the end of the day, one thing you cannot take away from Taylor Heineke is that he never gives up. Um, even when he throws in a bad interception, throws an inaccurate pass, makes the wrong decision, he keeps playing as if he didn't, which is what you got to have. You got to have that short term memory where it's like, okay, I made a mistake, but that doesn't define who I am. Keep going. And then, of course, the third thing, um, you know, he's from the metro Atlanta area. So if anybody's rooting for him, it's me more than anything else. The reason I want to see Sam Howe is just like commander wise, the future of this franchise wise, Taylor Heineke is not a franchise quarterback, but he's a great solution for what we have currently going this year. But I still want to throw Sam Howell out there because I don't, I mean, maybe you feel like Sam Howell is your franchise quarterback, then cool. But I don't want to go into this draft and you don't take uh, Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, or whoever, Hendon Hooker, whoever you want to take because you're like, oh, well, we haven't seen what Sam Howell has. We don't know if he's good or not. Don't let that happen. Other than that, though, I'm fine with seeing Taylor Heineke out there doing what he does. Again, he didn't play well overall. Um, it was kind of interesting, too, because... Going from the second half of last game in the first half of this game, he was very efficient. Um, you know, he still made mistakes here and there, but overall, he was pretty efficient. He, he was doing his thing. Um, um, a lot of it was short passes, too, so it's not like he was out there throwing the most incredible passes um, in the world. But at a certain point, going into halftime, I believe, um, dating back to the start of the second half against Green Bay through the first half of this last game, um, he completed 78% of his passes for 270 yards, two touchdowns, and no interceptions. I don't know what happened in the first half of the, the, the Green Bay Packers game and then the second half of this Colts game excluding that final drive. Um, but I don't know. That just I, I don't know why he was so bad in those times. It's like he just takes quarters to be bad. It's not even drive by drive. It's not even necessarily play by play. You can pretty much tell at the beginning of a quarter what Taylor Heineke you're getting. It's so weird. And I don't even remember it necessarily being like that last year, but this year, from just his two game small sample size, the quarters are either pretty much all good or pretty much all bad. There's really no ups and downs within quarters. It, it's kind of halves as well. But then again, that final drive against the Colts, man, he did what he had to do. Um, and also, before I forget, Scott Turner, same thing. Like in the first drive of the game, first couple of drives, those were some of his best play calling moments in commander history. I don't know where that came from. That was, I mean, you know how NFL teams do. Typically going into any NFL game, regular season, postseason, pretty much anything but preseason, they have like around 15 plays that they already have scripted, no matter what the Colts are really doing. They already have 15 plays they know going into the game, this is what we're going to do. And then based on how they react to certain things, we're going to start calling plays after that like we're gonna i'm actually gonna start okay they did this this time let's do this this time that's when it turns into a chess match but those first 15 plays are all scripted and so whatever 
you know, I guess Scott Turner in an open book test, he's he's a genius. But once he was beyond his notes and beyond his 15 play script, it got really ugly, mundane, simple. Even though I did like the fact that we started to run some read option. We ran like a speed option one time with Taylor Heineke where he was able to get it to Curtis Samuel, who's able to pick up some yards. So I, I'm, I'm happy that Scott Turner is finally starting to utilize Taylor Heineke's legs on purpose because for some reason he refused to do it last year. I mean, we never did read option with Taylor Heineke last year. As soon as he gets hurt, Kyle Allen comes into the game for a couple of plays with running read option. I was like, why? Why aren't you doing that with Taylor Heineke? But now we're finally starting to do that with Taylor Heineke. Thank goodness. Um, but um, Scott Turner's play calling for the majority of the middle of that game didn't like it. And, you know, I'm the t I am one of those people that defend Scott Turner when uh, people are on his head for things that aren't his fault. But quite a bit of that was his fault in the middle. Now, also, again, Taylor Heineke was just not playing well. Um, but a lot of it was also Scott Turner today as well. But then that those those last couple of drives, that man started to dial some stuff up. Now, I'm going to have to look at the All-22 and make sure that it wasn't Taylor Heineke's fault. Some of the blame that I'm putting on Scott Turner, maybe it was on somebody else. Maybe receivers were open, but Taylor Heineke didn't see him. I don't know. But I know for a fact those first couple of drives and those last couple of drives, Scott Turner was doing his thing. In between, it started to get a little ugly, and I am going to automatically place some blame on him from what I saw live. But I'm going to go look at the All-22. But again, Taylor Heineke, another up and down day. But it's kind of weird because it's not play by play. It's not even drive by drive. It's really quarter by quarter. You'll know what you get in Taylor Heineke any given quarter. It's so weird. Um, running back wise, love the one two punch with Antonio Gibson and Brian Robinson, of course. Today, um, and, uh, Antonio Gibson basically took over as the number one running back. I mean, Brian Robinson got some carries here and there um when it was like you know early down situation or like you know third and one we just needed a yard or something like that he was getting the ball um but for the most part like antonio gibson pretty much took over as the running back today um i mean their carries were very close eight to seven brian robinson at eight antonio gibson at seven but antonio gibson got the first two carries of the day and granted he only rushed for 19 yards which isn't great not a great average and Antonio and Brian Robinson rushed eight times for only 20 yards so that's not good either our rushing game was a struggle even though we had 96 yards total 29 came from Taylor Heineke and give Scott Turner some credit 29 came from Curtis Samuel that's a good way to use them um and then a couple of screens got blown up so I guess that technically took away um some of our rushing yards technically we should have had over 100 but Terry McLaurin had like a negative seven yard um run technically when the Colts uh blew it up um, but overall, running back wise, this was the first game that Antonio Gibson and Brian Robinson were almost dead even in carries. Um, I mean, some games since Brian Robinson's come back healthy, he'll get 20 carries about and Antonio Gibson gets like six. But today it was Brian Robinson, eight, Antonio Gibson, seven. I saw Brian Robinson running a little bit angrier today than he even has since we since he came back healthy from the gunshot um, situation. So I'm happy to see that. I'm optimistic about it. I wonder what went into the game plan as to why they started to give Antonio Gibson a couple of more carries but overall Antonio Gibson didn't necessarily even get a lot more carries than he normally does we just didn't run the ball well or as much as we normally do because again Brian Robinson went from like 20 carries to eight Antonio Gibson typically gets somewhere between like six to ten so seven is normal but it was just weird that it was that even but at the same time Antonio Gibson was heavily involved in the passing game seven targets caught all seven of them for 58 yards and a touchdown that's huge man that that's huge. We only won 17 to 16. Without Antonio Gibson, we lose the game. Period. Um, and so just running back wise, I mean, JD McKissick hasn't been heavily involved much. He had two carries for six yards and uh five targets, three catches for 14 yards. And that's really the most he's done in a few weeks. Um, it just seems like Antonio Gibson and Brian Robinson are starting to kind of take over with JD McKissick uh um, contributes to this team. I still love JD McKissick and I feel like he should still at least have like one of those random games, maybe once every two or three weeks, one once every two or three games where you kind of just feature him out of nowhere and catch a team off guard. But this two-headed monster of Antonio Gibson and Brian Robinson is definitely the future. Um they didn't really get it on the ground today, even though again they had some impressive runs for first downs, but overall yardage wise, they weren't very productive but i loved how we used antonio gibson in the passing game today absolutely loved it we're starting to really showcase what he can do the past two weeks antonio gibson in the passing game two straight games with a touchdown um as a receiver like come on man we got to keep him involved now going to the receivers um receiving wise terry mclaurin led 
everybody eight targets six catches 113 yards no touchdown but he'll take that that game winning catch basically over any touchdown of his career again with the moment that it was i mean my eyes were tearing up i mean i like i, I said it even before the game in one of my videos I'm like, I want to win, but the priority is for Terry McLaurin to have his moment. If anybody deserves it uh, on this entire team, it's him. Nobody deserves it more than him than, than to have his moment where he gets to go to his hometown and show out and ball out in front of his family because this guy has been nothing but humble with all of the quarterback situations he's been going through with not getting targeted when he needs to. Us as fans screaming, please throw Terry McLaurin the ball. The carousel at quarterback again. Um, all of the chaos going on, on and off the field with this team, Dan Snyder, Ron Rivera, just all of the injuries, everything. I mean, he's felt like he's been the only guy out there at times. A lot of the time, Curtis Samuel was hurt pretty much all last year. He finally gets a really good running mate in Jahan Dotson this year, and then now he's hurt. And Curtis Samuel's been balling out, but still, it just always seems like, man, now we're back at step one. And so I just felt like, and he's never complained perfect guy in the media answers all of the questions right does everything um philanthropy wise and just man he's like literally the perfect player on and off the field he deserved this moment man so i'm really happy for him 113 yards i think that's the most receiving yards he's had all year all season probably dating back well into last season as well probably maybe he had another 100 yard game this season that i don't remember but that 113 i'm looking at right now and the box score looks really nice including a 42 yarder um again no touchdown but he would easily take that game winning catch right there over any touchdown he's probably had in his career because of the moment where it was when it happened again he said he brought around 70 friends and family and remember he's undefeated in colt stadium since high school college Anytime he's played in Lucas Oil Stadium, he's undefeated. And again, like I made a point in a couple of videos ago, he also showed out at the Combine at Lucas Oil Stadium. Remember, the Combine is at Lucas Oil Stadium. And I remember watching his college tape. I was like, yeah, he looks fast. But him him running the 40 time that he ran, the 4-3, whatever it was, like a low 4-3, middle 4-3, whatever it was, was definitely faster than I even expected. And I just feel like whenever he's in Lucas Oil Stadium, he's at his best. He's motivated. And I, again, I'm just so happy he had that moment rest of the receivers wise cam sims had two targets one catch for uh, 21 yards i believe that other target was that terrible interception from taylor heineke um curtis samuel heavily involved in both the rushing and receiving again he had four carries for 29 yards and he had three receptions for 50 yards um if he starts to consistently get at least one touchdown a game that's a great fantasy option right there because no matter what curtis samuel is going to touch the ball a few times um, and then other than that, I mean, we just didn't really have a bunch of receivers available. We had Dax Milne, but again, Jahan Dawson's hurt. Deami Brown's hurt. So that's why we had to activate Kyrie McGowan from the practice squad all the way to the 53-man roster just so we could have some bodies out there again with Jahan Dawson um, and Deami Brown out. Now, moving on to the tight ends, I mean, nothing very noticeable from those guys other than um, I remember, I think John Bates had a really good block on one of our rushing touchdowns earlier in the, in the game. Um, it was like a really, really good block. It was, I, it was like, I think it was the first touchdown we scored. Um, he had like a super crazy block where like he had to get there fast enough and then the power he had to just completely take. I think it was a linebacker or a defensive lineman completely out of the play. Um, so John Bates always holding it down. Remember, Pro Football Focus felt like he was the best blocking tight end in the NFL last year, even as a rookie. And it seems like he's continuing that trend. Now, receiving wise, um, I mean, I mean, Armani Rogers had one catch for 13 yards. I love the fact that he's still involved. So, I mean, I'm just so happy that, first of all, he even made the 53-man roster, let alone still, you know, catching passes. He he was more productive last game and, and you utilized more last game, but he still had one catch for 13 yards. I'm cool with that. Um, and then John Bates had one catch for six yards, and that's really it for the tight ends. But, again, I just really appreciate the fact that Armani Rogers is becoming a better blocker, so he gets to be on the field more because um, you, you want him to be able to be a dual threat tight end to where like when he's on the field it's not automatic oh yeah the defense knows we're passing the ball because Armani Rogers is on the field he's starting to become a better blocker so we're getting to be a little bit more ambiguous with our play call in there a little bit more mysterious defense doesn't uh, mysterious uh defenses don't necessarily know what we're gonna do we're not telegraphing what we're gonna do just based on by the the tight end personnel we have out on the field any given play and then john base again dual threat i mean you you prefer him as a blocker but he got he can also contribute as a receiving target and then offensive line wise i felt like they held it down fairly well today um wasn't great 
but um with all of the injuries that we're dealing with i mean we had to bring trey turner back because um, S um sadiq charles was out due to illness so he had to start at right guard um and then andrew norwell i mean that one screen we had that got blown up i think it was the terry McLaurin screen that i was talking about earlier i mean he just completely missed on that linebacker that just came flying right past him i mean didn't even touch him i don't think and so i remember that play distinctly made me really upset with them but i think overall the offensive line held it down fairly well from what i remember i mean taylor heineke even though he used his legs to escape pressure quite a bit he still only got sacked twice um for 13 um 13 yards negatively so that's not really bad and um, I, they could have run blocked better but again when taylor heineke is your quarterback they're putting more defenders in the box because they don't necessarily believe that you're going to even try to throw it down the field um far so it's really hard for our offensive line to even open up run lanes we were already struggling to run block now with taylor heineke as your quarterback and again i'm not taking anything away from him but his lack of arm strength defenses clearly stacked the box if you watch the all 22 it's more defenders in the box going against taylor heineke than it was carson wentz but at the same time taylor heineke makes up for it by using his legs carson wentz was a statue in the in the paint and that's why our offensive line no matter what they did it would just always result in a sack for carson wentz anyway so it's kind of like taylor heineke's better for the passing game um blocking wise but he's worse for the run game blocking wise because again defenses don't respect us attacking them deep down the field um and then so now the run lanes are clogged with linebackers and safety so that's why it's a little bit harder for us to run the ball but still the offensive line there's there's improvement that needs to be made in the run game anyway but i'm just trying to explain why it's a little bit harder now with taylor heineke at quarterback than when carson wentz is at quarterback but again it's also scott turner you just need to call better plays draw up better plays call them in the better situations look at what the defense is giving you pre-snap and maybe give taylor heineke the chance to audible out of something run more read option to where taylor heineke can read what the defense is doing and if they got eight in the box try to hit somebody on a slant behind the linebackers that are playing up you know what i'm saying so there's a lot of blame to go around for is why um the run game hasn't been as potent but at the end of the day including terry mcclellan's negative seven yard screen pass we still had 96 yards rushing total which isn't terrible i mean jonathan taylor in the colts um only had 135 and he had a couple of big runs so um i mean 135 that's not an only that's good but we weren't that far behind without terry mclaurin's screen play we would have had 103 rushing yards and you know that's a 32 yard difference but that's not too bad i mean still needs to be way better though if we expect to beat the eagles the cowboys and the giants um you you got to be able to run the ball better than that and then moving on to the defense um i'm liking what i'm seeing from this defense bimba don't break they may give up a big play here and there but they will bail themselves out with a turnover when they need it that one jonathan allen strip sack deron Payne falling on it was super clutch the Colts were having probably one of their better drives Derek forrest comes up to force a fumble i mean it's just man the defense makes plays when they need to we are definitely winning these games because of our defense, like clearly. I mean, holding Aaron Rodgers to 0 of 6 on third downs the previous week, the way they were able to, I think the 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 um, the Bears were within the 10-yard line like three times and didn't score three times. I think, I mean, they were there more than three times, but there were three times that they were within the 10-yard line and didn't score a touchdown, didn't score any points at all. This defense is bailing this team out right now. We're winning games because of our defense. So, I mean, we used to be on Jack DeRio's head when the defense was playing terribly, especially about the third down situations. We've improved that overall. Today, we kind of took a step back on third downs. The Colts were able to convert 5 of 12, which is still good for a defense, but Sam Ellinger's legs made a difference. Him being able to scramble out of the pocket and either get the first down himself on third down or to find somebody open to throw it to him on third downs made a difference. Outside of that, our defense was really good on third downs. Now, our offense was terrible, 2 of 12 on third down. Just to, just to go ahead and add that in there while we're here. But they were 2 of 3 on fourth downs, which is pretty good because we needed one of those to even get that game-winning drive um but yeah the defense is stepping up big again they struggled a little bit we, we we just seem to struggle against mobile quarterbacks with gap integrity and responsibilities and discipline allowing guys even if they don't scramble around the edge rushes the edge rushers move too far out they just scramble right in between them and the defensive tackle fa Bada all the way over here jonathan allen doing what he's supposed to kind of do in the middle big hole for ellinger to run through and really just mobile quarterbacks just been killing us with that in general but again jack DeRio has figured something out with this defense even with william jackson the corner you're paying over to like 10 million a year to play for you he's supposed to be your number one corner we'll still find we're still finding ways to clutch up and win games and we finally had our turnover game 
I've been saying our defense has been suffocating for the past few weeks. The only thing stopping us from being a dominant defense and considered an elite defense is the lack of turnovers that we get. I mean, we we just not a turnover getting team. We, we just don't. But we finally had one of those games where we had two forced turnovers. It wasn't even necessarily like Colts mistakes. Like we like literally took the ball from them in these situations. So that's great. This defense played like an elite defense at times. Of course, they also, again, gave up some pretty big plays, some big runs, especially. Um, but overall, the defense is literally carrying us to wins. And just back to my main point, as much as we were on Jack DeRio's head in the beginning of the season, we need to also put that same energy towards um, thanking them and congratulating them for how this defense is playing right now. And to be able to adjust with all of the injuries, we still don't have Chase Young back. Again, the corner that you brought in to be your number one lockdown corner, you're paying him over $10 million a year. He's not even playing because of a back issue. So now you have a third round kind of rookie and a half because benjamin st juice barely even played last year with his concussion situation then you have a, a off the waiver wire sixth round rookie and rashad wild goose as your starting slot now granted he got beat a couple of times today but he's stepping up and then kendall fuller one of the least athletic starting corners in the nfl i love kendall fuller and i love what he does mentally he's everything that you would want in a corner like i said if you could put kendall fuller's brain into william jackson's body you literally have a top five corner in the nfl NFL. But either way, we have all of these deficiencies. I mean, love Benjamin St. Juice, but his change of direction is better than it's supposed to be with a guy with his length. But a double move is going to beat him. Like he got beat one time deep down the field. But Sam Ellinger, I can't remember if he missed him or if the receiver dropped it. We got, but we got bailed out on that play. Again, Rashad Wild Goose, his situation, like we're putting pieces together week to week and they're somehow making it where i mean cole holcomb wasn't out there today we had david mayo is technically our starter mike linebacker even though at times we just we were like nah cole, david mayo and john bostick are so bad that we ran out there with Jamin Davis as our only linebacker some plays. And we had five defensive linemen out there with John Ridgeway, the defensive lineman that we picked up to basically be like a slight Federian Mathis replacement, basically just be a nose tackle, a run stuffer, uh, a double team eater. Picked them up off of the, uh, the Cowboys, released them, placed them on waivers. Even though this is his rookie season, I don't know what happened for, the, for them to feel like they just had no use for him. But we're finding the use for him is working. He's not balling out. But again, like I talked about when Federian Mathis got hurt and we picked up John Ridgeway, he fills a role that nobody else can do. Love Deron Payne, love Jonathan Allen. But they're not necessarily the best double team eaters. They're not true nose tackles. That's what he does. But either way, we're out there with five defensive linemen, John Ridgeway in the middle. Jamin Davis is your only linebacker backer and then we're out there with the with the mixed up secondary with uh you, i mean you throw cameron curl out there bobby mccain kendall fuller benjamin st juice and then rashad wild goose and stuff like that at times um i mean we're just we're just finding a way to make it work shouts out to jack the rio for figuring out how to make it work i mean cole holcomb is one of our more important players he's been balling he's been in on pretty much every tackle and it seems like play made by this defense the past couple of weeks so losing him i just thought man trey turner starting at right guard and cole holcomb not there to start at linebacker i was like man i don't know how we're gonna survive this even if it is sam mellinger's first start in his nfl career how are we gonna make up for this jack the rio figured it out gotta give him his credit because i was one of the main people on jack the head is it time to move to chris harris all of that type of stuff but he's doing this thing this defense in general is doing their thing again i still feel like we give up too many big plays i also still feel like we don't get enough turnovers but today we got two and, and man that's what i've been asking for for weeks now but um yeah i mean just starting with the defensive line they balled out I mean, like I already talked about a couple of weeks ago, we are the best team in the NFL as far as getting pressure on the quarterback without blitzing. So we're only rush for defensive linemen. We are the best defensive line in the NFL at getting to the quarterback without blitzing, without being aggressive. You can just send four. We're going to get there. You can use the other seven players to allocate towards, you know, coverage and stuff like that. And that's what's been working. Bend but don't break. Rush four, still get pressure, have seven guys back there doing what they need to do. And you can dink and dunk us all you want, but it's not going to result in points. That's where that bend but don't break. And occasionally suffocating defense comes into play. And then eventually the defensive line is going to get to you. It's going to end up being a sack or something. Um, but again, we need to start getting some more fumbles and some more interceptions. Shouts out to Jonathan Allen for leading the way with a strip sack. I think that's one of the big things that we're going to get back with Chase Young as well. I already know he's a really good player. He's also the energy and the spirit of this team right now. Terry McLaurin's holding it down. And I guess when Chase Young comes back, we'll have two vocal leaders. Um, but one of the main reasons I can't wait to see Chase Young back out there is because one of his biggest 
like specialties one of his most unique things about him is that he's just a strip sack magnet uh, and master like i don't know if it's some of his luck maybe i don't know but either way chase young equals strip sacks that's just what he does um so i just can't wait for him to come back so we can create more turnovers like that but yeah the defensive line with all of the depth that we have fa abada casey to all of these guys are balling i don't know what casey to was doing in the preseason because he didn't look good then but he's been balling and like advanced analytics and pro football focus feels like he's one of the best players on our team one of the best defensive linemen in the league in just a few snaps that he plays fa abada for a while he may still be i'm not sure yet but um he's leading our team and i think in pressure rate right now as far as all out of all of our defensive linemen per snap basis he's our best pass rushing defensive lineman and of course jonathan allen balling i remember one play it was like a run stop play i think where jonathan allen like completely pushed an offensive lineman away like made him look like he was like a little kid like his son or something and then he went and made the tackle in the backfield so even just beyond that one strip sack that was huge for us because the Colts were about to score i mean we literally took away probably 14 points of the turnovers we had that's why turnovers are so important um but even beyond just that play jonathan allen was really good to run pain like i've been saying pay him montez sweat had his moments even though he didn't shine as much as he did in like the tight ends game and the bears game he still played pretty well everybody held it down man on the defensive line linebacker wise hard to judge i mean david mail had that one play where he almost intercepted it so that was a surprise i mean I, it's rare to hear david mayo made a good play in coverage but he did um overall i mean I, i'm gonna have to go look at the all 22 to see if he was you know poor in coverage outside of that play but i liked what i saw from david mayo when i noticed him but maybe he had a couple of plays where he was bad and i just didn't notice so that's on me i'm not to go look at the all 22 like i said i'm not gonna be on here making stuff up if i don't know i don't know jamin davis looked a little slow in the beginning of the game but then he started to pick it up and in that one play cameron curl made a great goal line play and then jamin davis had the 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 touchdown saving play even though he went unblocked that was still a great play you got to make a great tackle right there because it was quite a bit of space in that hole that was almost an open field tackle technically um so i felt like overall he had a really good day he started off a little slow he was kind of late to filling in the right gap in the run game i feel like a lot of those runs they were getting early on were his fault um, but he started to pick it up and gain some of his confidence and play a little bit faster later on. So shouts out to Jamin Davis. Even though you didn't have the best day, you recovered and, and you and you progressed and you got better. You made some mistakes and, and then you improved and, and got your get back. And that's one of the most important things. I mean, it's great to have a great day from start to finish, but to start off poorly and then to bounce back and, and that, that really shows what you're made of. So shouts out to Jamin Davis. You look like a true NFL linebacker out there right now. Really good um, second um, sophomore season right now from him he hasn't been perfect but he's been better this year than i thought he would be at this point and he's only going to get better uh and then secondary wise i mean benjamin st juice again got cooked a couple of times but overall man i'm loving what i'm seeing from a third round pick this this is technically his rookie and a half season rashad wild goose i mean i already explained this talking about the secondary but what jack the is doing with these guys now these guys are stepping up to make plays even though they get beat sometimes overall man they're doing their thing i'm really proud of them cameron curl had a couple of bad plays from what i remember but overall he balled out I mean, Cameron Curl has completely changed this defense. This defense without him compared to this defense with him, he's one of the main reasons why we went from allowing almost 30 points a game to now we're out here, Green Bay, six, zero for six on third downs, Colts scoring 16. The Bears, again, multiple trips to the end zone three times. They, they came away with no points at like within the 10, five yard line. Cameron Curl is one of the main reasons for that. I mean, if you go look at the, look at the like overall statistics of this defense before Cameron Curl was here and after Cameron Curl came back, it's a huge difference. And of course, I already told y'all this, but Cameron Curl is the number one ranked safety um, on pro football focus right now. They feel like he's literally been the best safety in the NFL and Derek Forrest isn't far behind him. Entering this game, he was the fifth ranked safety in the NFL. So technically, according to pro football focus, we have um, two top five safety, which gives us the best safety tandem in the NFL. But also Bobby McCain was really good today. Now I've already said it. I feel like Bobby McCain gets way too much hate and gets blamed for stuff that isn't his fault. But today was one of them days where he like balled out. Again, you got to kind of look at the all 22 to know what may have been his fault that I'm not sure of that like i'm maybe be placing blame on somebody else wrongly placing blame on the wrong person and it may have been his fault but from what i saw today he was making plays underneath he was making plays down the field coverage run support all of that so bobby mccain had a great day today whole secondary whole defense i mean when you only allow 16 points granted 
they, they had to get two or two turnovers to do it and granted it was sam ellinger's first nfl career start but again you only allow 16 points in the nfl your defense did something and when when we needed them the most they made the plays we needed man granted again i'm gonna keep saying it they got blessed by a couple of receiver drops just like the green bay game we got blessed with a couple of receiver drops open receivers for first down um but overall the defense uh played very well and we're winning these games because of our defense the offense it seems like they make the play when we need it, kinda, but it's it's our defense carrying us on this three game win streak point blank period, easily. Not even close. Offense again, they'll make the play sometimes when we need it, but right now it's our defense carrying us. Three game win streak, hopefully we can go make it four against the Vikings. Um, and then special teams wise, I, I like what I'm seeing from Antonio Gibson on kickoffs. I really have a good feeling. He even said it in the interview a few days ago. And I agree. I have a good feeling that he'll finally, he'll probably break one at some point this year. Because it always seems like he's like one or two guys away from potentially just gone, being gone. And guys, I mean, even as big as he is, you know, even guys smaller than him can't catch him. Once he's past everybody, it's a touchdown. Dax Mill still don't like what I see from him on punts because he doesn't provide any explosion. But he's safe. He doesn't muff punts. And we've seen i mean you can honestly argue that we beat the packers and the bears because of muff punts and dax Millen has yet to muff a punt and and so i because of that his stock has definitely risen in rivera's eyes so don't expect us to replace dax Millen anytime soon maybe in the offseason if we can find a guy that doesn't muff punts and also provide some explosion and maybe some field position flipping potential because dax Millen doesn't have any of that like i keep saying he's basically an automatic fair catch even if he does even if he doesn't call a fair catch his acceleration his speed his explosion is just so bad he's pretty much going to get tackled where he caught it anyway um but at the end of the day he's safe and us i mean finally we didn't go against a team that went that muffed the punt in our win streak this is our first time winning a game in this three game win streak where the opposing team didn't muff a punt that led to points for us three points for the packers and seven points against the bears and we needed those points we don't win the games without those points um so again i don't necessarily love dax Millen at punt return but that's why you're gonna see him as our punt returner for the rest of this season at the very least um because teams out here muffing punts man and then uh joey sly i mean you made the kicks we needed you to make you're still making me nervous um but you did what you had to do i mean you made the game winning pat i mean that's that's significant so shouts out to you and then of course um and and then he was also um one for one on his field goal um only a 28 yarder you you literally are supposed to make that i feel like i can almost go out there and make that so um you know he did what he was supposed to do but nothing special but man tress way is bailing us out with some of these field positions i remember when we started to lose momentum and then we couldn't get a first down so we punted the ball from like our own 20 yard line he somehow kicked it to like the coach 30 and they were able to run it up to like the 40 something but i don't think people understand how significant and game changing those type of field position switching punts are man because if, if he was just a regular everyday nfl punter maybe he punts it to like the 40 or 50 maybe and then they return it into like the 40 or 50 and then now they're almost in field goal range and maybe they take that momentum and score a touchdown get up three points you know like those are like point saving punts right there um so i, I just feel like even though our fan base appreciates stress way i still feel like people aren't even noticing the little things like that sometimes man so we just always got to acknowledge and 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 and, and thank Tress way for what he does man he should be a pro bowler every year but for some reason the nfl doesn't rock with him it's whatever but yeah man that's the end of this video please get in the comment section let me know how you feel about everything discussed in this video how do you feel about this game do you agree or disagree with any of my points again just to go back to it real quick i still prefer to see Howell out there because i feel like Howell will do the same thing where he's just gonna throw it up to terry mclaurin eyes closed like terry like taylor heineke i just feel like he gives you a little bit higher of a ceiling with his arm strength but right now taylor heineke is balling and you're obviously not gonna bench the quarterback no matter how bad he's playing at times not overall but at times no matter how terrible he's been at times um you're not benching the quarterback that has you um i mean he's won two games in a row but technically it's a three game winning streak you're not gonna stop that momentum because it's just basically gonna look like you're tanking if you throw sam Howell in at this point so obviously you don't throw sam Howell in yet um but i just think overall at some point especially if taylor heineke ends up um, I mean, what, even if Taylor Heineke plays exactly how he played today, but again, we're playing a better team and we lose, now we're going to start to look at him sideways because even though he did the exact same thing today as he did in, in another day, um, just because it's an L instead of a W, people are going to start to look at him sideways, and then maybe then we go to Sam Howell. 
um because i just don't really see taylor heineke being better or worse than what he is right now we already know what we got in him and that's my whole point that's why I, that's why i want to throw sam howell out there but right now we're on a win streak so obviously they're not um but yeah man definitely let me know how y'all feel about everything discussed in this video a dub is a dub man straight up four and four last place in the division even though some four and four teams are first place in the division it is what it is but yeah man i appreciate all the support man shout out to all of my sponsors especially my pro bowl sponsors names you scrolling the screen right now please leave a like on this video if you liked it if you learned anything i'll catch y'all later i'm out